Let's welcome Yeri Henry. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harry Henry and this is Green BS. Which one would it be if you could only choose one? And this is a question to you. I'll pop questions to you all the time. So a little bit of call and response, please respond in the chat. Which one would it be if you could only choose one between a toilet and a plasma screen TV? Most of you think this is a no brainer, but then there's a few of you who say, ah, it's a football World Cup year. There are public toilets. A couple of years back, I had the chance to travel extensively in Southeast Asia. And what I witnessed, especially in the suburbs, was that most homes seem to have a massive 65 plus inch plasma screen TV. And during the commercial break, I saw what was primarily the husband go through the house into the backyard and use a hole in the ground as a toilet. And I first thought to myself, huh, that's a bit strange in terms of preferences and choices until I realized actually buying a TV is a very simple personal choice. All you need to do is to be able to afford it. And even if you can't, you can probably buy it and pay it off on rates over five or six years. A toilet, however, is a highly complex collective decision. You don't just need the toilet that you buy on Amazon. You'll also need plumbing. And you all know, especially if you live in London like me, how difficult it is to get a plumber these days. But you'll need the plumbing, you need the sewer, sewer system, which means that you'll need the expertise, the investment, the local council, and potentially the regional council. As humans, we're excellent at making individual choices, individual decisions. We're really rather lousy at making collective ones. Just look at the state of the, the world at this moment. And I posit that the best way to move the needle in terms of collective decision-making is using behavioral science to help us. Let me demonstrate that to you in a little game that we're going to play. I will enlist you to help me to stop global warming in just 90 seconds. Now I ask for your help, everyone who's in the My Speaker studio, everyone, the jury as well, I think you can do this, especially if you have pen and paper. Now, if you're in the My Speaker studio, um, my uh, colleagues will have probably put an envelope with these cards under your chair, attached under your chair or other sneaky way to give them to you. Unfortunately, I'm not Santa Claus, so I couldn't get to all of you who are listening at this moment. So you'll have to do with the screenshot of the cards. The average carbon footprint per year of a person in, this, in the Nordics is 9,000 kilograms. Um, a little bit less in some of the countries, a little bit more in others, the, the Dutch about 9,000, the Germans about 9,000, so are the Finns, the Norwegians a bit more. And very annoyingly for the rest of us Nordics, of course, the Swedish have the lowest. Your job now is going to be to reduce or to lay out a life with these cards that depicts 5,000 kilograms of carbon footprint, which is the global average, which is what the average world citizen has. You'll have 90 seconds to do this. I suggest that you do the following first. You pick a must-win battle, which is you choose one card, one thing that you think is absolutely essential to your happiness and one that you can easily get rid of. For example, you might love your car more than your husband, or you are uh, a barbecue chef and you just need to be a carnivore. Now, I'll put on a timer for 90 seconds. I'll ask you to all to do this task, but you'll, you'll understand the rest that I'm telling you much better as a result. The time is running now. 90 seconds. Five thousand kilograms in total. We still have about a full minute left, and at this stage, I tell you the Joker is just there to confuse you. Because I also run this as a ten-minute game, a six-minute game, a four-minute game, and I tell you, honest to God, you are the first people who are doing this in just 90 seconds. And I have massive belief that you can do it. 45 seconds to go, man, it's a lot of time, isn't it? Especially if you're the speaker. Half a minute to go. Be a good citizen. Be like the Swedish, damn it. I hate saying that, I'm Finnish. I'm joking, of course. The lower, the better. Ladies and gentlemen, 10 seconds to go. Five. And time. Now note how you all managed. 
at least all of all, most of you will have managed. It might have felt hectic. You might have been annoyed with the fact that there's time pressure on something as important as this. It felt rushed, but you managed. And that's because humankind, while lousy at making complex decisions that are collective and uh, that are several decisions at the same time, were excellent at making decisions framed as personal choice trade-offs. And against that backdrop, I've created a little um, methodology that I call the Green BS methodology. I'm sure you all guessed that Green BS stands for Green Behavioral Science, of course. <laughs> and uh, the methodology consists of five parts. We begin with a power question. We continue with providing data transparency. Then we define the rules of the game, a framework of personal choice, which you just got to enjoy, and of course, a must-win battle. The first thing we need to do is uh, define a power question. Let me demonstrate why questions are so important. A question is the quickest way to focus the collective in the same direction. Let me demonstrate that to you. How old are you guys? Now, I absolutely don't care how old you guys are. You look absolutely lovely for your age that I don't know. Um, however, note how it was impossible for you not to think about your age in that moment. How old are you going to be at your next birthday? See, we did it again. Behavioral science defines a number of questions that are more powerful than others, and they call them power questions. Power questions have in common that they... Uh, guide you towards an actionable solution, a solution rather than all the problems that may come with the answer. But my favorite power question, the one that I asked on your behalf before we began this game was, what would it take for these people to drop their carbon footprint from 9,000 to 5,000 in just 90 seconds? The second part is of course providing data transparency. You needed to know what your carbon footprint is. You needed to know what the carbon footprint of your actions is, and you needed to know what goal you're shooting for. When you know all these things and you have clearly defined rules, for example, the constraints around what you can and cannot do, how much time you have for this, which was your biggest constraint, and the fact that you can't earn carbon back by taking virtuous action. For instance, the only car you had available was a diesel car. You didn't have a, um, an electric car available or the possibility to use renewable energy. Now, once I've given you the rules of the game, the constraints and the target to gun for, we all go, our mind gamifies the problem and has a go at it because it wants to win. And we're excellent at beating that. I bet we could do this in 60 seconds in the future. Now, then the next thing is we build a framework of personal choice, of trade-offs. As long as you're allowed trade-offs, you as humans, we as humans feel in control, and it's easy for us to make decisions. And of course, I asked you to choose a must-win battle, which helps us prioritize. Once we set down a priority, a must-win battle, everything else tends to fall into place really rather neatly. So what would it take to stop global warming? I propose a climate choice menu. At the beginning of every year, we get a menu a little bit similar, but of course, much more complex than the card game that I just showed you. And we pick our carbon footprint for the year in line with sustainability targets with a carbon neutral society, for example. And we'll end up making choices. And if we need to make the change the choices later on, for example, our best friend just decided to get married in Las Vegas or heaven forbid in Antarctica, we'll need a long distance flight. What we need to do now is of course, we need to earn carbon back and we would be able to do so with virtuous actions like using renewables, electric cars or not using a car at all, or finally sticking that New Year's resolution of no longer eating red meat. Now I promised you some examples of where this is applied nicely or not at all nicely in business. First, the negative example, I like to use Mercedes because I love them as a company and they've actually uh, had redemption at the end of the story. They have now got a much better sustainability strategy. But back in the days, they posited that they will be carbon neutral in 2050. Now, I took a look at their um, board of directors picture on Google at that time. And what that picture told me was, we're all going to be dead in 2050 anyway. So we hope that technology is going to solve it by 2040. And then our children's children, children are hopefully going to do something about this. They clearly have no power question that they asked there was no data available at that time to actually measure the carbon footprint that they were at. They had no targets to shoot for, which meant that there were no trade-offs that individual managers could take, and there was no clear, clear must-win battle. By contrast, Volvo defined, uh, around their target, defined a very clear must-win battle, and they said, by 2030, all our models have to be uh, electric. A positive example from an industry that you perhaps don't always associate with sustainability, a medium-sized Finnish packaging company called Wipak in plastic packaging posed the question, what would it take to be carbon neutral in 2025 and 2019 when they ramped up their new strategy? And the backlash was immediate. People said that it's impossible. 
Well, they came back and said, look, you're not answering the question. The question wasn't, what is it possible or not? What's going to happen? The question was, what would need to happen for this to be possible? And when you ask a better question, you have a better answer as well. So when you know how, that, how what it takes to be carbon neutral in 2025, you, of course, also know how to be carbon neutral in 2030, 2035, even 2050. Then they calculated their carbon footprint all the way down to the product level to know what the size of the task was. After that, they built a clear game plan. First, they needed to be fully recyclable in their packaging and then fully recyclable and also based on green raw materials. The next step was individual targets. The different regions act differently. So the trade-offs that you have in China are different to the trade-offs when you have a manufacturing plant in Finland because the geopolitical as well as the regulatory framework, of course, being very, very different and moving at different paces. And finally, there was one big, massive must-win battle. Plastic packaging is primarily made of crude oil at this moment as a raw, uh, raw material. 80% of the carbon footprint of a plastic packager roughly is crude oil. So substituting crude oil as a raw material to something renewable would be and remains the must-win battle. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whether you need television masts or you need plumbing or you need much better sustainability policies, you now have a methodology you can take to your decision makers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this game. It was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Thank you very much. Uh, Did you I manage, Andre? I, I, I had to give up my car and my and even my, my the, the eating fish. I, had, I, I really down to the... Well, I'm a vegetarian most of the time anyway. So thank you very much for the exercise. And I do encourage everyone to do send a question to each one of our speakers. Uh, didn't get one for you, so... Uh, you are at my mercy, Yuri. I, I will ask you a, a question if that... Sorry? Shoot. So I, I will... Uh, I, apparently, if I refresh, there will be a question. So I'm refreshing my site, and apparently I will now be getting a Q&A question from our audience. Okay, I got it. Yes, thank you. Now I have refreshed my, my, pa my pad, and I have one question for you. So here we go. Uh, how would you advise a, a, a business leader or board member to define the power, the power question? So there's a number that are very useful and they apply differently in different situations, but a really good starting point is what would it take, right? A lot of the time when we make business strategies, we start with small incremental improvements because no one gets fired when you do small incremental improvements. 5% growth, 10% growth. But these don't bring about game changers. So if you ask, for instance, a question, what would it take for us to double our business next year? You get a completely different answer. By the way, implicitly, you'll still know how to grow by 10% or 5%, right? Um, so, so again, if, if without any further context, I would say, let's ask the question of what would it take to get to your absolute moonshot? Thank you so much, Yeri, for your wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.